Insight, picking right back up in the middle of the action, chapter 3, part 5. Bot is being dragged to Gulheim, and something has happened strange. As they fled, the ghouls paused only to turn and make rude gestures at the beast and possibly also at Bod. The beast stayed where it was. It's going to eat me, Bod thought bitterly. Smart, Bod. And he thought of his home in the graveyard and how he could no longer remember why he had ever left. Monster dog or no monster dog, he had to get back home once more. There were people waiting for him. He pushed past the beast, jumped down to the next step, four feet below, fell his height, landed on his ankle, which twisted underneath him painfully, and he dropped heavily onto the rock. He could hear the beast running, jumping down towards him, and he tried to wriggle away to pull himself up onto his feet, but his ankle was useless now, numb and in pain, and before he could stop himself, he fell again. He fell off the step, away from the rock wall, out into space, off the cliffside where he dropped, a nightmarish tumble down distances Bod could not even imagine. And as he fell, he was certain he heard a voice coming from the general direction of the gray beast, and it said, in Miss Lepescu's voice, Oh, Bod! It was like every dream of falling he had ever had, a scared and frantic drop through space. As he headed towards the ground below, he felt as though his mind was only big enough for one huge thought. So, that big dog was actually Miss Lepescu, and I'm going to hit the rock floor and splat, competed in his head for occupation. Something wrapped, himself, wrapped itself around him, falling at the same speed he was falling, and then there was the loud flapping of leathery wings, and everything slowed. The ground no longer seemed to be heading towards him at the same speed. The wings flapped harder. They lifted slightly, and now the only thought in Bod's head was, I'm flying! And he was. He turned his head. Above him was a dark brown head, perfectly bald, with deep eyes that looked as if they were polished slabs of black glass. Bod made the screeching noise that meant help in Nightgaunt, and the Nightgaunt smiled and made a deep hooting noise and returned. It seemed pleased. A swoop and a slow, and they touched down on the desert floor with a thump. Bod tried to stand on his ankle but it betrayed him once again, sent him stumbling down into the sand. The wind was high, and the sharp desert sand blew hard, stinging Bod's skin. The night gaunt crouched beside him, its leathery wings folded on its back. Bod had grown up in the in a graveyard and was used to images of winged people, but the angels on the headstones looked nothing like this. And now, <clears throat> bounding toward them across the desert floor, in the shadow of Gulheim, a huge gray beast like an enormous dog, the dog spoke in Miss Lepescu's voice. It said, This is the third time the night gaunts have saved your life, Bod. The first was when you called for help. They heard. They got the message to me, telling me where you were. The second was around the fire last night, when you were asleep, and they were circling in the darkness, and heard a couple of the ghouls saying that you were ill luck for them, and that they should beat your brains in with a rock and put you somewhere they could find you again when you were properly rotted down. And then they would eat you. The night gaunts dealt with the matter silently, and now this. Miss Lepescu? The great dog-like head lowered towards him, and for one mad, fear-filled moment, he thought that he was going to take a bite out of him. But her tongue licked the side of his face affectionately. You hurt your ankle. Yeah, I can't stand on it. Let's get you onto my back, said the huge gray beast that was Miss Lepescu. She said something in the night gaunt screeching tongue, and it came over, held Bod up while he put his arms around Miss Lepescu's neck. Hold my fur, she said. Hold tight. Now, before we go, say... And she made a high screeching noise. What does it mean? Thank you, or goodbye, both. Bod screeched as best he could, and the night gaunt made an amused chuckle. Then it made a similar noise, and it spread its great leathery wings, and it ran into the desert. Wind flapping hard, and the wind caught it and carried it aloft like a kite that had begun to fly. Now, said the beast that was Miss Lupescu, hold on tightly. And she began to run. 
Are we going to the Wall of Graves? To the Ghoul Gates? No, those are for ghouls. I am a hound of God. I travel my own road, into hell and out of it. And it seemed to Bod as if she ran even faster then. The huge moon rose in the smaller mold-colored moon, and they were joined by a ruby-red moon, and the gray wolf ran at a steady lope beneath them across the desert of bones. She stopped by a broken clay building that had an enormous beehive built beside a small rill of water that came bubbling out of the desert rock, splashed down into a tiny pool, and was gone again. The gray wolf put her head down and drank, and Bod scooped water up into his hands, drinking the water in a dozen tiny gulps. This is the boundary, said the gray wolf that was Miss Lupescu, and Bod looked up. The three moons had gone. Now he could see the Milky Way, see it as he had never seen it before, a glimmering shroud across the arch of the sky. The sky was filled with stars. They're beautiful, said Bod. When we get you home, said Miss Lupescu, I teach you the names of the stars and the constellations. I'd like that, admitted Bod. Bod clambered onto her huge gray back once more, and he buried his face in her fur, and he held on tightly, and it seemed only moments later that he was being carried, awkwardly as a grown woman carries a six-year-old boy, across the graveyard to the Owens's tomb. He's hurt his ankle, Miss Lepiscu was saying. "'Poor little soul,' said Mistress Owens, taking the boy from her "'and cradling him in her capable, if insubstantial, arms. "'I can't say I didn't worry, for I did, but he's back now, and that's all that matters.' "'And then he was perfectly comfortable beneath the earth in a good place "'with his head on his own pillow, and a gentle, exhausted darkness took him. "'Bod's left ankle was swollen and purple. "'Dr. Trefusis, 1870-1936,' to May he wake to glory, inspected it and pronounced it merely sprained. Miss Lepescu returned from a journey to the chemists with a tight ankle bandage, and Josiah Worthington Bartholomew, who had been buried with his ebony walking cane, insisted on lending it to Bod, who had too much fun leaning on the stick and pretending to be one hundred years old. Bod limped up the hill and retrieved a folded piece of paper from beneath a stone. The Hounds of God, he read. It was printed in a purple ink and was the first item on a list. Those that men call werewolves or lycanthropes call themselves the hounds of God, as they claim their transformation is a gift from their creator, and they repay the gift with their tenacity, for they will pursue an evildoer to the very gates of hell. Bod nodded. Not just evildoers, he thought. He read the rest of the list, committing it to memory as best he could. Then he went down to the chapel where Miss Lepescu was waiting for him with a small meat pie and a huge bag of chips she had brought from the fish and chips shop at the bottom of the hill and another pile of purple inked duplicated lists. The two of them shared the chips and once or twice Miss Lepescu even smiled. Silas came back at the end of the month. He carried his black bag in his left hand and he held his right arm stiffly. But he was Silas, and Bod was happy to see him, and even happier when Silas gave him a present, a little model of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. It was almost midnight, and it was still not fully dark. The three of them sat on top of the hill with the lights of the city glimmering beneath them. I trust that all went well in my absence, said Silas. I learned a lot, said Bod, still holding his bridge. He pointed up into the night sky. That's Orion the hunter, up there with his belt of three stars. That's Taurus the bull. Very good, said Silas. And you? asked Bod. Did you learn anything while you were away? Oh, yes, said Silas, but he declined to elaborate. I also, said Miss Lepescu primly, I also learned things. Good, said Silas. An owl hooted in the branches of an oak tree. You know... I heard rumors while I was away, said Silas, that some weeks ago you both went somewhat further afield than I would have been able to follow. Normally, I would advise caution, but, unlike some, the ghoul folk have short memories. Bod said, It's okay. Miss Lupesco looked after me. I was never in any danger. Miss Lupescu looked at Bod, and her eyes shone. Then she looked at Silas. There are so many things to know, she said. Perhaps I come back next year in high summer also to teach the boy again. Silas looked at Miss Lupescu, and he raised an eyebrow, a fraction. 
Then he looked at Bod. I'd like that, said Bod. <laughs> it's the end of that chapter. Oh man, what a thrilling conclusion. I noticed something, and I don't know if anybody else did, but there was a little hint early on about Miss Lepescu. Has anybody ever read any of the Harry Potter books or seen any of the Harry Potter movies? If you have, you might remember a character named Professor Lupin. And Professor Lupin, it turns out, also had a st ability to transform, kind of the way Miss Lepescu does. And I got to thinking about Lupin Lupescu. And any of you French speakers out there might know that the word for wolf in French is Lou, spelled L-O-U-P. And I wonder if that was a little hint the author was giving us, that there was something special or strange about these characters, Lupin Lupescu. Anyway, fun end to the story, or to this chapter, that is. Until next time...